Welcome to the introduction to Monte Carlo methods. In this lecture, we're going to dive into some of the fundamentals of Monte Carlo methods and try to understand where they're applied. So Monte Carlo methods are methods for generating random variables directly or indirectly from a target distribution. And applications of Monte Carlo methods are in hypothesis testing and Bayesian computation. However, some things to note are that Monte Carlo methods are not strictly Bayesian, and they're not strictly frequentist either. They're known as parametric sampling or parametric bootstrapping, and Monte Carlo methods represent a method of statistical simulation. And simulation in general can help us un understand reality without needing to run multiple experiments or costly calculations. The use of Monte Carlo methods uh, to calculate p-values uh, is pretty popular. And reasons for this include that uh, many test statistics don't always have a standard asymptotic distribution. And even if a standard asymptotic distribution does exist, it might not be reliable uh, given the realistic sample sizes that uh, some of us might work with day to day. So Monte Carlo methods in general help us calculate uh, better, more accurate p-values. And here we're going to explore an example where we can do such. So here is uh, some data for uh, a contingency table given uh, two treatments and two results. So somebody with cancer either gets ra surgery or radiation and either the cancer is controlled or not. And our hypothesis testing, sorry, our hypothesis are that uh, either the categorical variables are independent or dependent. Basically, uh, either depending on what treatment you get, there's uh, a change in the rate of success for controlled. And for this type of uh, problem, we would generally apply a chi-squared test. So let's look at the chi-squared test a little closer. Uh, there are two ways to apply the chi-squared test. Uh, so one is goodness of fit, and the other is to test for independence. And the formula uh, to compute the chi-squared statistic is shown here. And if you still need a little bit more uh, information about the chi-squared statistic, you can just follow this link, uh, and it'll take you to a Wikipedia page where you can read more about it. So a disadvantage about the chi-square test is that it requires a sufficient sample size in order for the chi-square approximation to be valid. So when cell counts are low, uh, say below 5 or sometimes 10, the asymptotic properties don't hold well. And what we would get out of that is uh, possibly an invalid p-value, uh, which would increase uh, type 1 or type 2 uh, error rates. So what we're going to witness is that Monte Carlo methods can improve on this situation. Uh, they can come to the rescue and give us a more accurate p-value. So what we need to uh, use uh, for our Monte Carlo methods in this simulation example will be a couple of functions. So here I wrote up a simulation, or sorry, a function called simulate KISC which basically takes in uh, some characteristics of the contingency table that we're looking to generate from. And what we're going to do is calculate the expected cell counts uh, for the contingency, con the contingency table and pass them through this function. And this function is going to generate many more contingency tables, creating a distribution of those uh, contingent tables, which we can then uh, use to calculate uh, chi-squared distributions. So once we get a chi-squared distribution, uh, or distribution of chi-squared uh, statistics, we'll be able to calculate uh, Monte Carlo p-value. 
And this function here uh, really leverages the function called uh, R2D table. And I recommend that you read through the documentation. It uses a special algorithm to calculate those contingency tables. And in addition to the function you saw previously, I created another wrapper function, which uh, just helps us uh, follow the do the data analysis a little cleaner. Uh, takes in data and uh, in addition to that, uh, a number of simulations we want to run. And uh, what it reports is the Pearson uh, chi-square statistic, a Monte Carlo p-value, and the raw p-value we would get from just the asymptotic uh, distribution of the chi-square test. So let's run our uh, results. And so I'm going to pull up a terminal, and I actually uh, ran some of the results earlier. So first, I pass in my data, uh, run, uh, pass in my functions so that they're in memory. And then I pass my data and, uh, into my function, and I tell it to run 10,000 simulations. So it reports uh, this Pearson statistic for the chi-square test. A Monte Carlo p-value and a raw p-value that is based on asymptotic properties of the chi-square statistic test. And you can see that the Monte Carlo p-value is much lower than the raw p-value. And when I compare this with R's uh, chi-test function, it gets uh, it throws an error uh, saying the chi-square uh, approximation might be incorrect so what I needed to do was pass a flag and uh, this function sorry this parameter uh, simulate p-value accepts a number of uh, iterations to run and it just happens that I ran 10,000 simulations um, actually sorry I think I Passed the flag incorrectly. Uh, let's try to do this again. So I'm just going to copy this and let's see what it does. So I think this needs to be true and B needs to be to set to 10,000. Let's see what we get. Okay, now our results are based on 10,000, just uh, like our results over here. So what you can see here is that this chi squared uh, statistic is pretty much equal to ours. Their Monte Carlo p-value is very close to ours as well. And it's also lower than the raw p-value uh, that the that we would get if we use uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So here you just witnessed that Monte Carlo uh, provided a more accurate results, a more accurate p-value, and we were able to make the same uh, decision. We were going to make this, but we were able to do it with more confidence now. So we failed to reject the null hypothesis of independence. And now we're going to look at a different example. So let's look at inferences on a single proportion. So this example was taken from this textbook, Open Intro Statistics. And in the textbook, there was uh, uh, a survey of um, adults where about a, um, a thousand adults reported that they supported some, um, some uh, s nuclear arms reduction. And this proportion is 56%. And we want to test uh, whether this proportion is significantly different from 50%. So we calculate our Z statistic, and we get a p-value. And this p-value is definitely significantly lower than uh, 5%. So we can reject the null hypothesis uh, with a confidence of 95%. And we could also calculate confidence intervals. So we created an estimate of our 
a known uh, parameter, which was uh, the prob the proportion of adults who support this uh, this deal, and we were able to create a confidence interval. Now let's put a different spin to this problem. Uh, let's see how a Bayesian would look at this problem. So instead of p, uh, let's uh, denote it with theta. And let's put a, a distribution on, on theta. So instead of uh, saying that theta is some fixed value, we're going to say that it's uh, a random variable that follows a beta 1, 1 distribution. So the data model that we're looking at is that uh, the observed data uh, comes from a binomial distribution and that theta, uh, which is the probability, or sorry, the proportion of adults who support uh, this measure is a random variable that comes from a beta 1, 1 distribution. And if you're not too familiar with the beta distribution, uh, the beta 1, 1 distribution is basically equivalent to the uniform 0 to 1 distribution. So this is uh, pretty much a non formed prior. We're saying that um, we're not, we don't have any uh, prior information to the to add to this uh, model so let's just put a, a non-informative prior uh, to this and the reason I'm using a beta distribution uh, for this is because the beta is conjugate to the binomial distribution and if you follow this link it'll take you to this Wikipedia page where it'll show you a uh, different uh, model parameters, uh, conjugates, and priors, uh, and you could use this to help you throughout the course. But basically, uh, the reason we're wanting to put a Bayesian spin to this problem is because we want to create an interval where we can say that the estimate of theta falls within this interval with a probability of 95%. Previously, in the frequentist uh, perspective, we, w we wouldn't be able to say that. We just have some level of confidence that uh, this, ex this certain experiment captured the true value of theta. Here, we're saying that uh, we have some uh, probability to this. And what we call this is a credible interval. And if you want to read a little bit more about uh, the difference between confidence interval and credible interval, just follow this link here. So now that we have a data model, we can calculate the posterior distribution to then make inferences on theta. So we have Bayes formula here, and which is proportional to this product, which is the likelihood times the prior. And so we have the likelihood times the prior, and we could just ignore the constants. And what we end up with is another beta distribution. So here's the data model again. We are putting a binomial distribution on the data, uh, a beta distribution on the unknown proportion, which is theta, and we're coming out with a posterior distribution, which is, an, again, another beta distribution. So now that we have our posterior distribution, we can simulate from it to generate a distribution of uh, samples that are potentially uh, a good estimate for theta. So I sample directly from the beta distribution and I uh, calculate some quantiles, sorry, some percentiles from, from that distribution. And I'm just going to use the median, uh, the 50th percentile, as my estimate for theta, just for simplicity. And I'm going to take the 2.5% and the 97.5% to be uh, to form my credible interval. So I'm saying uh, that there's a probability of 95% that the value of theta falls within these two bounds. And this is something that you get uh, through the Bayesian uh, perspective. You get a distribution of the parameter that you're trying to estimate, and you get uh, credible intervals. 
And here's the code uh, if you want to try to generate this uh, on your own. So in the previous example, uh, you saw that we were able to calculate the posterior and simulate directly from, from it. However, sometimes uh, posterior distributions or uh, target distributions uh, that we're trying to sample from aren't easily identifiable or they're just too complicated to sample from directly. So in general, Monte Carlo methods are great for helping us uh, sample from these difficult to sample target distributions. And in the next lecture, you're going to uh, see so that we're going to introduce topics of generating random variables and generating random variables uh, from target distributions using various transformation methods.